Oh, you you don't, you're not talking about the fan. I love that song. I pay a dollar one. to a donut. Tony can't play it. I am ready for the fan for sure. I'm ready and excited to play the fan as well as dog races. Hoi hoi, welcome. This is Feet Beat, the Little Feet radio show. Today we have special guest Tony Leone joining us. Tony is the new drummer for Little Feet. Tony, so glad you can join us. Uh, Larry Lister, the drummer for the Boke Drunks, is joining us soon. So you were telling us uh, about Kenny throwing down the gauntlet on the fan. You want to wait till Larry to talk about that or what do you want to do? Sure. I mean, I uh, I have lots of ammo to come back at with that one. <laughs> <laughs> I had been, I had done a bunch of the um, trips to Jamaica with the Midnight Ramble Band. I did, I did maybe, f I think four of those. Okay. And uh, on one of the, one of the last couple, I found myself kind of like during the day, not much happening. I was kind of just on the beach um, and had been listening to Feet Don't Fail Me Now. And there's a studio version of the fan on that record. And I really kind of that afternoon just was by myself, just chilling on the beach and just listened to that tune over and over again. I started to think like, how, I, like, how long did it take those guys to get that thing together? Because it's not just as simple as, well, oh yeah, you know, it's a vamp in seven where the band just plays over uh, like a, a, a one chord vamp in, in seven, eight time or seven, four, whatever. So I started to listen to it and really try and understand the how the vocal fits up with the band and how the whole thing links together. So I've kind of started to play the thing just from feel after a while. So anyway, I was sitting on the beach kind of obsessing over this arrangement. I must have listened to it about 10 times in a row. And uh, it got to be time for dinner. I started walking towards dinner and I ran into Bill and Polly. And I said, I got Billy here. I got to ask him about the fan, you know, what his memories were of trying to get that thing together in the studio. He just kind of said, well, you know, uh, you know, I had that vamp on the keyboard and we started there and then we put some lyrics together. He made it seem very simple and, and I'm still trying to get to the bottom of I, you know, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall watching those guys rehearse that thing. And it's um, a testament to the idea that a group mind can come up with something, you know, where the sum is uh, greater than the parts, you know. When I met Lowell back in 77. I asked him, you know, about working with Richie. And he said, yeah. he told Richie, just drop a beat. Just drop. I'm sure. <laughs> Richie's playing is so interesting because it's so deeply rooted in the Delta and New Orleans funk. I met Richie a couple of times. And the second, the last time I met him, I got to tell him, you know, how much I loved his playing. And that for me, I felt like he was a, he was uh, almost a, uh, Hey, Larry, it was a um, kind of a, a marriage of styles of, of almost like Levon meets Zigaboo from the meters, you know? Exactly. <laughs> and, it, and when I said that, you know, he totally, I could tell he was really, um, you know, knocked out by that, you know, and, and he was like, man, that's a huge compliment, you know, and but to me, it's kind of an obvious thing. And I feel like there's so many different kind of elements to Richie's style, you know, but feel, I feel like is first and foremost, you know, his feel was, his was great. And then technically he was kind of a little more advanced than maybe some of the other rock drummers of his day, you know, but not in a bookish kind of way in the way that we're talking about with the way those guys came up with the arrangements, just drop a beat, for example, you know? <laughs> so, and then they came up with something cool. <laughs> Larry, uh, welcome. Tony said that he's ready to address uh, Kenny's throwdown of being able to play the fan. We started there. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be, you know, there's probably going to be a little bit of an adjustment. You know, these guys have all been playing together for so long. 
I mean, I've played with a bunch of different people, and I've been a fan of Little Feet since I first heard them, which probably for me would have been around 82 or 83, like when I was just discovering FM Rock in Hartford, Connecticut. So I've been listening to their music a long time, but, you know, we still have to play together as a group, and there's no way to just jump in and have it sound immediately, you know. Well, you've got... Uh... Port Chester on November 11th to start the by request tour. Yeah. And uh, I guess Kenny told us you got a week of rehearsals scheduled before then. So that'll be a fun way to sort oh, that, it out. Yeah. Yeah. That, that'll be where we work out some kinks for sure. And you've got uh, the December 8th live stream, which I know there's a lot of fans all over the world looking forward to that. Uh, so Excellent. they've been telling us that uh, they can't wait. And then just announced the other day, was it uh, Wednesday? The uh, Waiting for Columbus tour. So that'll be great. Can't look, I'm looking forward to that. I know, Larry, you're probably going to be at the Chicago show, right? And a few others. Yeah, probably. yeah. I just, I just bought front row balcony tickets. Best seats in the house. We'll see. Excellent. Nice. Looking forward to it. So, oh, my goodness. we got so much to go over today. Tony, I know you've played with, uh, you know, Ola Bell and uh, Amy Helm and Chris Robinson. And uh, I know you've sat in with the Almond Brothers and you toured with Phil and friends, maybe, so many players. Maybe you can just give us a little summary or maybe you could tell us, aside from Little Feet, who's the favorite artist you've worked with? Each different situation that I've ever been in has had its own qualities, you know. Um, the band Olabel for me was a real departure from what, I, from what I had been doing prior to that, you know. Um, you were a jazz musician up till then, pretty much, right? I mean, you know, I grew up playing rock and roll and rock bands all through high school, but when I got to college, I got very serious about playing jazz and then decided that this was going to be my path, you know, and ended up working with some of the old guard of, of jazz, you know, people like Lou Donaldson and Illinois Jacket and Cecil Payne, who had played baritone in Dizzy Gillespie's band, you know, and that was kind of what I was doing. But my heart and where I came up, the music I came up with was always a part of me as well. And so I never stopped listening to the Rolling Stones and I never stopped listening to Led Zeppelin and the band. And during that time, while I was getting deeper into playing jazz and, and the music of Coltrane and Miles Davis and Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. I was also starting to really dig deeper into people like Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan. So when Ola Bell started, it was kind of like this lightning bolt moment for me. You know, like, you know what? You have to embrace the music that you came up listening to and loving too, you know. jazz world is very i mean there's so many excellent players I, I i always liken it to um to bluegrass you know like it's a disciplined approach to playing music and very you have to have tunnel vision to really be great at it you know to a certain degree and for me i got to a certain level with that where i felt like you know what i can i can pursue this further but there's so much music that's a part of who I am um, that I want to start to really check in with. And it's important in life to decide who you are as well as, you know, discipline yourself to to work hard towards something. So anyway, so Ola Bell starting was a big deal um, and meeting Levon mm -hmm. was huge for me. You know, it was like a huge another lightning bolt moment you know getting to be around him going up to the midnight rambles every saturday whether i was going to play or not you know i went because i wanted to be there and i got to sit right behind the drums and, and hear him play and hear him play a shuffle every night you know, every saturday and hear him play those band tunes every saturday and hear him sing and and so that was an incredible you know, uh, lightning bolt moment, you know, and then speaking of lightning bolts, playing with Phil in the times that I have played with Phil have been 
really exciting because it allowed me, um, I spent a fair amount of time in the 80s going to Grateful Dead concerts, you know, from about 84 to about 90, I probably saw maybe 20 shows. Not as many as some, but, you know, more than most and enough to kind of have a feeling for the Grateful Dead. And, and, and Jerry Garcia still to this day, he's one of my favorite musicians for his expressiveness and also for his roots, the, the music that he comes out of, blues and bluegrass mm -hmm. and country and folk. So, so getting to meet and play with Phil was like allowing me to be in the, in this uh, kind of experimental situation in terms of the improvisational parts of the music and taking what I had learned from drummers like Tony Williams and Elvin Jones and Billy Higgins and kind of approaching that music with that same kind of um, openness and so those, the dead tunes almost became like jazz standards. So it was super uh, fun and rewarding because, you know, he always says things like there are no mistakes, only opportunities. So it really allows you the freedom <laughs> to put it out there and, and take a chance. And so that was that was always super fun. Now some of those things you did with Phil and Friends that probably led to uh, working with Anders Osborne and the Dead that's Feet where I shows. Met Anders, yeah, that's where I met Anders. And interesting story about when I met Anders, we were out at Terrapin Crossroads. Now Anders has is a uh, you know he's originally from Sweden, but he's he is basically he's a guy from New Orleans. He has spent uh, I think over thirty years there, and it's he loves that city. He he. He um, knows all the history. I mean, he is, he's New Orleans, you know, through and through. And um, now, for me, my introduction to New Orleans music was through Little Feet, you know. Okay. Uh, and some of my biggest heroes are Professor Longhair and Dr. John and, and Alan Toussaint and Meters. And I learned about those guys through through Bill Play Bill Payne's piano playing and Richie Hayward's grooves and Kenny Gradney, you know, and these guys were like, that was my gateway drug to, to New Orleans music, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so, but, so I met Anders and I, the, the conversation was going on and on. And finally I had to confess that I had never been to New Orleans, you know, and this was like 2014. Mm -hmm. when I met him oh, wow. and I say, man, you know, I, I got to see, you know, we were talking about professor long hair and the meters and, and, uh, I said, man, you know, I, I got to confess, man, I, I've actually never been in New Orleans and his jaw dropped and he looked at me and he was like, <laughs> he was like, we got to get you down in New Orleans, bruh. <laughs> and next thing I knew, a couple months later, I was down there rehearsing with him, you know, and, and for some gigs and, uh, and, um, and so for, for that, I'll always be thankful to Anders for, uh, you know, because, um, had some memorable gigs with him down there and on the road. So. Playing in Dead Feet the first time you met Paul and Fred? I had actually met Paul and Fred up at a ramble up at Levon oh, okay. prior to that, you know? And um, because a mutual friend of all of ours, a guy who lives up in Woodstock, who was road manager for the band in the 90s, Butch Denner, knew that I was a huge Feet fan and, uh, and was telling those guys about me and then was like, you know, telling me, all right, next time Paul and, Paulie and Fred are up here, you got to meet them, you know? And so they were at a ramble and I met them there and, uh, you know, they were just two of the coolest dudes. And then when we got to play together, um, 
at Dead Feet. You know, that was a blast because it was, you know, me and Billy Kreutzman on double drums and uh, and uh, Paul and Fred and we and and Anders. Take your whole pain away. so many pictures from those nights backstage taking selfies with your friend and Paul, you know, <laughs> that was kind of the first time I got to really hang with Paul and Fred. And you get to go back to New Orleans as part of the Waiting for Columbus tour, right? So psyched. We're playing at the Sanger. That's going to yeah. be, be great. Excellent. Yeah, I'm just really looking forward to the whole thing. And um, I've had plenty of time to think about and practice the music because you know the the funny thing is that they asked me to join like in April of 2020 or something, or end of March or early April of 2020, right after the pandemic hit. So it's been like a year and a half of just kind of like, when, when are we going to get going? You know, waiting for Columbus. You know, <laughs> waiting is the, the operative word there, man. It's just been like a lot of waiting. I was kind of wondering how you managed to do the. Uh... The drums on you did is it a long distance love and also uh when all boats rise correct mm -hmm. so how did did you have to go into a studio because i know my goodness it takes a while to get those drums mic'd up you just have it all set up in your house scott sherrard has a good friend named uh charlie martinez who's going to be doing front of house with us nice. when we go out he's an exceptional um engineer um it was worked with like steely dan and a bunch of different people and and engineered a lot of really cool different projects over the years so it was always kind of like you know if charlie had some free time they would sneak me into his studio and we also did a version of fat man that uh is almost finished i believe excellent an elongated version of fat man with like some horn solos and extended Bill Payne solo and some killer slide from both Fred and Scott, you know, so. I heard an early version of that recording that I know is still kind of in the can. Um, You've heard it already? I heard, yeah, I heard part of it. It's been a while, so, and it wasn't, the, it wasn't a full thing. Bill sent me a, a link or something and he was talking about the kick, an insert or something that they've used on the kick drum to get, just to, just to fill the sound out or something. Uh -huh. it, it was it was some reason like that that he said, I want you to hear this. And and I was just going, I don't care about the kick drum sound, but I, <laughs> but I sure like the guy playing it. <laughs> That's cool. I mean, yeah. You know. the, the story that I wanted to relay, it was that um, when, when you guys were doing Long Distance Love, I, I don't know if I heard it right after it came out or maybe a little before because I was in contact with Bill about some of it. And I, I said, man, that that's a brilliant first song to do because it's one of those things that for me I was really curious to see how you approached it because you can just approach it straight ahead and it's just you know bang it out and and it just sort of lays there but you know Richie had this finesse thing going and I was like man I'd love to see how, how Tony approached it and then when I heard it I just smiled I was just yeah it's, it, there's so many like, tasty things in there and just you know really nuancy cool, cool groove things and then when I went back prepping for this and listened to Olabel, I was going, ah, uh, yeah, I can see, I can see where that, you know, that that came from somewhere else, and it, it, it was really, it was really cool. I, I, I really, really. Enjoyed. Thanks, man. You know, I'll, I'll tell you when we, when they told me that we were going to be going in, and that was the that was the first thing that. You know, this is like my going to be my first thing with the band. So, and knowing that we didn't have a lot of time, right? And we were sneaking, we're, we're doing it at Charlie's studio. I just, I'll tell you exactly what I did, man. I went out and I wrote down Richie's part exactly, note for note. You know, so you transcribed it? I transcribed it. And wow. then, and the, and the reason why I did that was because the way Kenny and Richie are playing on that recording, it doesn't sound like they're just making it up as they go along to me. It sounds like they had particular spots where they said, all right, let's make this kick together. You know, how, however they discussed it, you know, if Kenny may have just played like a, 
a melody and said, man, when we get to this section, I'm going to play it. Here's what I'm going to play. And Richie lined his thing up with it. I, I mean, I don't know. Once again, I wasn't there, <laughs> which I was. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it seems like maybe that kind of um, group orchestration was happening. And I'll tell you, man, the deeper I've gotten into this music and the more I practice it, I don't think enough can be said for the connection that was happening between Kenny and Richie. And I even mentioned it to Kenny. I called him up one day because I think I was working on day or night. And I said, I was like, man, I just, I gotta call up Kenny. And, um, and I said, man, you guys, you're the bass drum and the bass, they're always in sync. How'd you guys do that? And he's, and he was so cool about it. He, he just basically said, Man, don't worry. Our our bass and bass drum are gonna be synced up too. You know, <laughs> I was hoping for something a little more, you know, analytical, Kenny. You know, <laughs> but he he was very encouraging, and you know, um, so I've gotten into uh, writing down a bunch of Richie's things, just so not so I could play him note for note, but maybe so that I could capture some of that character, you know, because. Obviously, nobody can be Richie Hayward, man. You know, he was an original for sure. Uh, but I can say that um, I've loved his playing for a long time. I'm going to try and uh, keep as many of those elements in there as, as I can going forward with the music, you know. Now, you've been working on the By Request Tour and, of course, Waiting for Columbus. Has yeah. there been any... I know we've talked about the fan and Day at the Dog Races, um, would you say those are the most challenging songs that uh, you've got coming up at you? Or is there anything else that maybe you're thinking, oh my goodness, I need to get in rehearsal and really get this down? Or The tune representing the Mambo for me was not really on my radar for a long time. And I remember when that record came out, I remember it coming out after um, let it roll. I remember let it roll coming out. It was a huge record. So rep the tune representing the mambo for a minute. It took me a minute to get my head into it, you know. But um, but once I kind of deciphered it and wrote a little roadmap cheat sheet for it, you know. Now I at least have uh, you know a little GPS there to keep keep my to to know which sections are coming up next and things like that. It's more like a story, you know, mm -hmm. that has a flow to it. So um, Gringo is another one. Some of the earlier ones that have come up, um, let's see, Got No Shadow, Strawberry Flats has a couple of little things in it. So are these all things that we could possibly hear on the By Request Tour? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, so you could be probably hearing anything from you know from the first little feet record up through time loves a hero at least or down on the farm like any of that stuff is going to be fair game there's definitely a bunch of stuff from let it roll um there's a few from representing the mambo there's stuff from rooster rag so i mean i think you could be looking at things being pulled from any particular era of Little Feet, you know. Now, T Kenny also told us that uh, you're going to be singing some of them. That's true. Um, that's true. Uh, Bill and Scott are going to be taking a lion's share for sure. But it just so happens that um, my range is very similar to Paul Verrer. So it'll be my honor to take the lead on a few of those um, numbers. Uh, maybe I won't disclose which ones. Right yeah, I, I, I get the impression that y'all are not allowed to disclose just yet. <laughs> I, I, I think, um, you know, it hasn't been it hasn't been put to us in, in those kind of terms. But uh, I think we all want to keep the suspense sizzling a little bit, you know. And honestly, you know, it's suspense for all of us, too, because, man, you know, we we got to get together and play before we go out and, and do some gigs. So I can't I can't say enough how excited about it I am. You know, to get to play with the first time we did that that long distance love video and it got to the end and it said Little Feet and it listed everybody's name. You know, and I saw you know Bill Payne, Fred Tackett, Kenny Gradney, Sam Clayton, Tony Leone. I was like what 
<laughs> no. Really? So yeah, I'm I, I I'm super excited for the whole. Very thing. cool. Well, of course, you've got uh, two tours: the By Request and the Waiting for Columbus tour. Do you have any time on the books, or are you going to go into the recording studio? Fans want to know. With feet, um, yeah. I don't know that there's set time, but I think fans can expect that there will be some new material recorded. It, it will happen. Well, my goodness, I can't thank you enough, Tony, for your time. If you had something from uh, from Chris Robinson that you've done that you're really proud of, what would that be? You know, there's there's one of the last things we we recorded was a thing called "Let It Fall," and I would say that groove. It started with a riff that, that Chris came up with, and I would say that that groove was very influenced by Richie, at least the feel of it. So we had a record, it was our last record, it was called Servants of the Sun, and it's called Let It Fall, and it's got kind of a funky-ish you know kind of, uh, feel to it. And, you know, I got my little percussion set up with timbali and cowbell and stuff happening on there. Excellent. So. We'll be sure to give that a listen, maybe even play it in the next Little Feet radio show. Speaking of Richie, one of the things that Larry and I did just a few months ago was uh, talking about the song Fool Yourself, Mm -hmm. which has been sampled almost 100 times by other artists, that drum kick, the intro. I did not know that. That's incredible. Uh, Any reason that you can think of that Fool Yourself, that drum beat might be so, um, I think some people refer to it as the Little Feet beat. It's infectious, man. It is. It's like a signature Richie beat, that halftime shuffle thing. It's kind of perfect, that intro. You know, it just sets up the rest of the tune perfectly. That's one of Richie's signatures. I mean, the the tune Hamburger Midnight from the first record has a similar kind of thing. Dixie Chicken, of course, you know, but it's all that that halftime shuffle thing you know and that, which is totally it's totally along the same lines of the stuff that levon was doing in the band too you know with yep. tunes like up on cripple creek and and um and don't do it you know and things like that where it's uh like levon used to say and i think he said well you know we could have went up on cripple creek she sends me if i spring a leak no but he said man that would get old real quick so they they made it in half you know you know and that's that to me that was the thing that that immediately grabbed me about both of those guys when i was 12 13 years old and just starting as a drummer you know like man, that's a cool beat, you know. It's and my, I remember my dad used to talk about Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich all the time, and I I loved that stuff. I loved being able to look at those guys and being like, man, that's so cool. But like none of the drums in any of the songs that I liked at that time sounded like that. So I just I thought it was just a different thing, you know. So when I heard things like Dixie Chicken or Fat Man on the radio plus slide guitar is something i've always been a fan of you know and one common thing about all those you mentioned is that they all really do have that elemental new orleans definitely drug back you know way back on your heels but it's kind of broke the broken groove yeah like from the from the old street beats and yeah and you know and richie the first thing richie ever told me was he was just like if you like my playing, you need to listen to Zigaboo and Johnny Badakovich. And that's amazing. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah, he's and and that's like I said, that was he was the gateway drug to all that stuff. You know, all those new me Orleans too, drummers. Man. For me and, too. Yeah, they're, it's a, it's it's good stuff. You know, and then it was like you know the meters, and then it was also like Robert Palmer that sneaking Sally through the alley record. I mean, man, those guys were just all so funky. Man, the whole band was just so funky. Indeed. My goodness. Well, I look forward to hearing the, the funkiness that you're going to bring to Little Feet. And uh, I want to thank you and all the fans are going to thank you as well. And uh, hopefully to see you. I know that it's going to be a, a bit of a lockdown up in New York. So I don't know if there's going to be too much of a chance to hang with the fans, but I will be in Port Chester. Uh, we get a chance to say hello. Good. If not, sometime down the road. That could be a song that you might hear it at some point as well. <laughs> Very good. Well, nice to talk to you guys. Thanks for having me. Yes. Great to La- meet you, Tony. Larry, thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Tony. Thank you.
take it easy, guys. Yeah. Thanks again.